For a long time, I'd cherished the idea of returning to Australia to make a series of films about how my country had changed and how it had not changed in the 35 years since I left. Well, that was the idea of it, and it was all going very well until one day, on my way back from a fishing trip on this very road, I found out that Australia still had the power to surprise me nastily. Australian art critic and author Robert Hughes has been seriously injured in a car accident near Broome in the north of Western Australia. He's been Police say there was a head-on collision more than 100 kilometres south of Broome. rescuers more than an hour to reach the scene and Mr Hughes was trapped inside for another fall. Leg and chest injuries, a lot of internal injury, but a lot of broken bones. He was described as being in a critical condition at Royal Perth Hospital. Beside the doctors and the local fire brigade, my fishing pal Danny O'Sullivan did the most to get me through that night. I haven't uh, seen this car since I, uh, I crashed it. Me neither, Bob, but... Uh, Shit, is that it? There she is, matey. Bloody hell. It brings it all back a little bit, doesn't it? Oh, my God. You wouldn't walk away from that, would you? You'd think not. But living proof is that we're here to have a look at it. Well, I didn't walk away from it, except... <laughs> no, no, no. Well, there's nothing left of it. You know, I don't understand why I've still got a face. I, I, I went into that windshield. Come I'm on. so... I'm just so grateful to you. You know, I, I had no... Obviously, the biggest concern was that there was fuel leaking out of here. Yeah. Which is pretty bad. You're obviously really worried that uh, it was going to go up in flames. I was terrified of that. I remember being terrified I of that. I think I remember at some stage asking that if it did go up, uh, could we end it for you? Yes. I, I was terrified of being burnt alive. I think we all are. And I, I remember begging you that if it did go up, you'd, you'd just shoot me or somehow other finish me off. But uh, I, I think you would have because you're a true friend. Look at that, Danny. I sheared off every bloody spoke in that thing with my chest. Remember these, mate? Those are my glasses. Cripes. Do you know they were there? No, mate, no. It was a... Well, that's a good pair. I was hoping I to find something I wondered just what like the that. hell had happened to my glasses. Well, now we know. I think I'll take those back to Sydney and have them fixed. It's a $300 pair of glasses. I can't, can't, can't waste that. <laughs> what else have we got there? Bloody much use now. <laughs> OK, yeah. Bill, you better... I think, I think we move these forward a little bit. Lean OK. Forward. Oh, you want me to, to lean, lean forward. To lean into it? Yeah, lean forward. Ah, uh, yes. Belly back. That sense of... That sense it. of... Yeah. That's it. That's more Barely right. overcome anguish, That's which... Right. Yeah. All, yeah. The, all the This dishevelled creature isn't, in fact, a vindictive male nurse. It's Bill Leake, in my opinion, Australia's best caricaturist. Yeah. And Bill chin is up, painting my portrait. Yeah. Chin up, that's it. Gut in. Gut in, chin up. Oh, God, it feels unnatural. Got it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> It'll feel a lot more unnatural in about two hours. Yeah, I'll tell you. The original idea was I, I, I thought of a great white expanse, you know, with a white leg in plaster and lots of plaster and bandages and things all over the place and Bob's big angry head lying on a white pillow, you know. This, this incredible mind that hasn't been affected by the accident, just waiting for the body to catch up and get back onto speed, you know, or up to speed. And, um, and the thought occurred to me that I could call it Robert Hughes, nothing if not critical. Of course, by the time I did get around to doing the painting, he was up and about. And I told him that I wanted to have him in his dressing gown with the sticks because that original idea was still what I was after. When you look back on it now, do you, do you have a feeling that the whole experience of that accident has changed your relationship to Australia itself? Uh, yeah, of course it has, because, you see, you don't really uh, get the full... Is the word gamut? Yes, the full gamut of your feelings about uh, a place unless you uh, realise you're about to die in it, actually. And so I feel a real need to get to know Australia again. I wouldn't feel it so strongly without the crash. And the first thing I want to look at, because of my own miserable year, is the sense of fun and pleasure that such a strong part of Australia and its way of life. We are seen as a nation of fun seekers, but is there more going on behind our easy-going facade? 
But remember, instead of a thoughtful and nicely constructed essay on Australia, you're just as likely to get the codeine fueled rantings of an outpatient. At first sight, so much of Australia seems to be about pleasure. Made for it, especially the southeast coastline along which the vast majority of Australians choose to live. The beach has become an integral part of our life and our identity. Our pursuit of pleasure appears ingrained, second nature. Hey mate! Can you, can you tell me, tell, tell me something, is it ancient Egyptians or ancient Romans? We're Egyptians, mate. Egyptians, that's what I thought, yeah, yeah. To look at Australian pleasure, a good place to start is here at Sydney's annual gay and lesbian Mardi Gras. It's the extreme public expression of our national hedonism for gays and straights alike. <laughs> it attracts well over half a million people and a few years ago, it actually outdrew the Pope's visit to Sydney. It would have been unimaginable in the Australia of my youth. Listen, just uh, do me a favour and vogue a bit, will you? Fantastic, thank you. During the warm-up to the parade, I met my date for the evening, Vanessa Wagner, who hosts its television coverage. See, I've got no basis of comparison for this because I've never actually been to a Sydney gay and lesbian Mardi Gras before, but I, I, I have the impression that it is somewhat less ideological in its spirit than the ones that I've been to in the United States. Do you think that's true? I think so. I mean, people are fighting all the time to get their messages across, so... I see it as a celebration. It's a celebration of pleasure, fundamentally, isn't it? It is, and it's also uh, it's a chance to actually give the viewers in Australia something to actually put on their colour television sets. Yes. Because let's face it, well, we've had colour television for a long time and we don't really utilise it. You certainly do that, babe. I, <laughs> I can't. It is the finest cross-cultural cod piece that I've ever seen in my whole life. Yes. Not that I've seen many, but that is really a beauty. But having fun was something we'd always had difficulties with. It's something we had to relearn. We weren't founded by Puritans, but we often behave as though we were. This is a surf life-saving carnival. Again, there's a lot of flesh on show, but you couldn't imagine a greater contrast with Mardi Gras. It's a festival of wholesomeness and civic virtue. We have taken the beach over the day for competition. We have permission off the local council to do that. Uh, because all our skills are honed through competition. It's not totally about pleasure. Everyone has to be responsible. Everyone needs to be mindful when they attend the beach. And get yourself a nice juicy sausage steak, egg or bacon sandwich, pop or whatever, and go they get There have always been strong forces in this country deeply suspicious of pleasure. You can see the tensions in displays like this. Pleasure and repression. Are we really having fun yet? Tension was there from the start in Australia's penal origins. The new continent may have looked like a paradise some of the time, but in fact, it was a jail. The first white inhabitants were convicts and their jailers, and they were involved in a unique and harrowing social experiment. If you want to see it played out and make a day of it, this is the place for you. Old Sydney Town. Old Sydney Town is a recreation of Sydney as it was between 1788, the arrival of the First Fleet, and 1810. What it does is it shows the, the life and times of, of the characters that would have been in Old Sydney Town at the time. 
I played the Reverend Samuel Marsden, the flogging parson. Reverend Marsden, how would you describe him? He relished in, in the pain and the, and the poverty and, and the, and the, uh, of the convict. I came to old Sydney town 20 years ago, right from the moment it held a fascination for me. And um, when the uh, opportunity came up to, to work here, I, I jumped at it. <laughs> I enjoy being out there performing. I enjoy imparting um, some of the historical knowledge of the time. Repent before God! Old Sydney Town is the only theme park in the world devoted to punishment and repression. And early colonial Australia was certainly that. The continent of sin had to transform itself into the continent of respectability. What is the name of our governor? You do not know, girl? You will be punished afterwards, girl. A harsh moral code instilled by the Reverend Marsden and his ilk tried to implant in the new nation a deep sense of shame, a convict stain that would spread into successive generations. Stop! Stop! Hands behind your back! Hands behind your back! What is this that I have in my hand? It is called a rod of correction. It leaves a mark upon your back. When you go home at the end of the day, your parents will see that mark upon your back. And they'll be so ashamed that they'll punish you further. Yes, I, I taught for about 30 years, and uh, it's my, what not, my, my way of uh, getting my revenge on the little horrors, I suppose. It's not your best writing, boy! Do it again! These are day boys arriving at St Ignatius College, my old school in Sydney. This is where I first learned about privation, beating and discipline, though not in so harsh a way. There are some people who like to go back to their old schools at regular intervals. I am, for one reason or another, not one of them, and I haven't been back to Riverview in 45 years. This is the first time. No part of the school grounds has more meaning for me than this circular flower bed with a statue of the Sacred Heart rising from the middle of it. Now, I've never forgotten, I was in a Greek class run by Charles Fraser, and Charlie looks out the third floor window up there and he stiffens visibly, and turning white as a sheet, he runs out the door of the classroom and disappears. And what he's seen was a cow eating his roses. He went downstairs to the Father Minister's office, opened a drawer, got out a 38. We saw him hold out the gun at arm's length, point it at the cow and say, if you don't get away from my roses, I'm going to have to shoot you. And the cow just chomped on its rose a bit more. And Charlie Fraser pulled the trigger and the cow went over four legs in the air and crushed most of the roses in the vicinity in its dying kicks. And it became, understandably, I think, one of the legends of the school, and I'm tremendously proud to have actually witnessed it. I feel sure the cows graze safely at St Ignatius these days, and perhaps the heat of religious conviction is a little lower. One of the things that has never changed in my memory is the way in which we were fundamentally raised here. St. Ignatius Loyola was a Spanish soldier who conceived a system of Catholic instruction which was very much along the military model. To be here, it was made clear to you, was to be inducted into the cavalry of the Lord. We will return to the fear which is often expressed that uh, we're sliding back little by little into a kind of rerun of the 1950s? Well, I think that the current leadership is trying very hard to do that because that's where, that's where John Howard's mindset is. Mm -hmm. The uh, Prime Minister. That's right. Mm -hmm. He hasn't emerged from the 1950s and um, he seems rather resentful of anyone who has. You mean a moral censoriousness? Yes, moral censoriousness. Which yeah. is all the more vivid because it's at so much more at odds with the way that people actually live. That's the sort of thing that makes you think, what on earth is going on here? You know, it was just a given that we were no longer one of those countries that let the moral majority 
tell us what we were allowed to watch when we went to the cinema and what we were allowed to do when we went out to enjoy ourselves. And all of a sudden, we've become a place like that again. And I find that particularly galling. But, you know, good stuff for a cartoonist. Can we just hold these for a second, folks? Yeah? We have today a religious faction within Parliament that's sort of a secret organisation called the Lions Forum. Now, that, that group, um, they seem to wield incredible power still in the Cabinet. They still think that they can preach from the pulpit. The Catholic Church and other churches in Australia have always been far rougher on the sensuous sinner than they, you know, they are in other countries. Yeah. We were born in sin, we were conceived in sin, mm. you know, and uh, there is that 30% which wants to make up for it by mm. increasingly ferocious and repressive kind of religious-based laws. To control its early moral chaos, Australia developed a strong and intrusive strain of righteousness. It addressed not just sexual licence, but the evils of drink, gambling and any kind of impropriety. It was personified in the figure of the wowser, a blue nose, a do-gooder, the parson watching beadily over the fence. A wowser is a man obsessed with the idea or the notion that someone somewhere might be enjoying himself. Back at the build-up to Mardi Gras, the Wowsers are out in force. They're here every year and there's something of a sideshow in their own right. What do you hope to achieve by, by coming here? It's simply um, to speak out for righteousness. Uh, they've been promoting this as a family day. Tell me, do you think that all the parents who come here with their children, do you think they're all in some way morally deranged? Because yes, I do. You do. Robert, it's a combination of the laxness of Australians that just, oh, she'll be right, let it go, we'll have a good time. Well, I would have thought that that was what this parade is about. It's not about evangelism, it's about having a good yes, time. It, it, and that it includes is. the homosexual Jew walking In a gesture of pure wowser killjoy, the soldiers of Jesus usually pray for rain to dampen down the ardour of the proceedings. The nemesis of the great Australian wowser is the larrikin, the flip side of the national character. Boozy, anti-authoritarian, irresponsible, and with a steadfast refusal to take anyone seriously. The wowser is there to keep this side of us in check. Well, the bloke at the top is saying, for God's sake, stop laughing, this is serious. <laughs> <laughs> and why that cartoon? Well, it just perfectly encapsulates that spirit of Australian larrikinism, I think. I mean, these blokes are in serious trouble and they still think it's extremely funny. <laughs> You'll fire upon that convict right between the eyes. Yeah, you want a bigger target? Yeah, hit that, hey? Larrikinism has been with us since the early days of the colony in the delinquents who refused to bow down and live within the system. Old Sydney Town's very own outlaw is Robert Stubbs. I think these fellas definitely were the forerunners of today's larrikin. You've only got to listen to the, the style of the dry sense of humour that Australians will have and they... I mean, a, a terrible tragedy can happen and within half an hour the, the hotel they're telling jokes about dingoes and babies and all sorts of things like that. So they make light of very hard situations because of the, the way that they were forced to live. So they, uh, yeah, they developed a sense of humour to... Um, Sort of, I don't know, stop them going mad, really. These outlaws were the first real Australian folk heroes. Their exploits became the stuff of legend avidly consumed throughout the 19th century. 
When the bush rangers died out, the spirit of spiky nonconformity lived on. The larrikin spirit is an important part of how Australians see themselves and are seen by others. This has been deftly exploited by the clothing and design company Mambo. Their designs on t-shirts and beachwear have become a commercial larrikin art form. I think it's instinctive to me and the other people who, who contribute work is just taking the piss, I suppose. We do tend to specialise in dirty pictures. No, I, I personally specialise in the lower half of the male anatomy. <laughs> That's my area. I do enjoy irritating people to some extent, and we've had a certain um, success with that. There's been a few boycotts and angry letters, and there's been a few um, bomb threats, actually, too. And... Anything to do with Jesus, we just get bombarded with letters of protest letters from people threatening never to buy our product again to actually burn the, um, burn the clothes that they had bought in the past. Nobody here has got an MBA or anything, but I think if there's one basic principle of, of businesses, it's that if you piss off half the people, the other half will, will adore you. Every art movement needs a manifesto, and commercial design, like Mambo's, is no exception. The Mambo boys have made a mint with their larrikin styles of expression. And their cheeky shopping mail dada is really the old teen culture delinquency of the 60s. But to reach an international youth market, they've had to get more generic. Has the larrikin finally reached his sell-by date? Actually, no. He's just waiting to change shape again. I'd like to say now that Australia is cosmopolitan and very sophisticated, and, uh, and that's true to an extent. But there's still a very healthy, jobbish element, which I partially subscribe to myself. I just keep doing churning out the same old rubbish, basically. <laughs> The one thing that unites absolutely everyone, larrikin and wowser alike, is sport. Our collective obsession and the greatest source of our national pride. H.G. <laughs> Nelson and rampaging Roy Slavin, otherwise known as Roy and H.G., are the high priests at the Temple of Australian Sport, its best-loved commentators. Well, Roy, of course, uh, a lot of interest in sport goes back to the cot. I mean, obviously, parents on the job, nine months later, kitty pops out. Mm. Fairly traditional story anywhere in the world. But then it gets interesting in Australia, doesn't it? It uh, does, it does. The first question fathers, fathers, and I use that term advisedly, would often say to the doctor who was there for the uh, drop, is, uh, is there any hint of green and gold? Yeah, yeah, in I'd the say kitty, true, yeah. In the kitty. Meaning? Meaning. Is it possible that I've got a champion here? Yeah. Who could play for Who Australia? Who could play for Australia? Wear the green and gold the, jumper. The green and gold jumper. Mm. And uh, the doctor would often, Nero style, give the thumbs up or thumbs down, often just through the window. And dads knew what was meant. Yeah. You know, if a doctor walked past with a wink and with a thumb up, you knew, you beauty, yeah. I've got a kangaroo. Yeah, that's right. You know, that's I've right. got a world beater. Uh, and I, I can remember dad coming into the bedroom because. Um, you know, in Lithgow, uh, where rugby league was God, uh, was the only religion, really. Mm. He'd open the sliding door, mm. uh, which he'd oiled so it was silent, and steal into the bedroom where I was lying. And he'd wake me up by hurling a ball at me. <laughs> so I'd wake up being branded yeah. by... And I had to identify very quickly, you know, yeah. instantly what the yeah. ball was that had woken me up. You know, so it was either whack on the side of the head with a, with a cricket ball yeah. or a football or a basketball, which would give you that ringing in the ears. Yeah. You know, and if I got it wrong, you'd take me out of the backyard into the coal heap and tear strips off me. But it was worth it, worth that, that smile on Dad's face when I got it right. You know, mm. when you'd go, whack, cricket ball, Dad! And then the and big, that grin. big grin on yeah. his face, and he'd yeah. pick me up and take me out, and lashings big... of butter on the toast. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, so that were the extremes. It was either lashings of butter and bacon mm. and fat, mm. or it was uh, a boot up the date in the coal heap. In between those two extremes, lie Australia. Yay! Come back.
back, come back. Sporting prowess half defines our national identity. Practically all our heroes are sportsmen and women. Sport is the only form of elitism we accept, and this is one of the great Australian hypocrisies. St Ignatius wasn't as sport-obsessed as other schools, but my own preferred mode of expression, the visual arts, got a lot less airtime. Almost none, in fact. Art was not on the school curriculum. I mean, they didn't teach you anything about it. Nobody did. You see, there wasn't very much in the way of great original art other than Australian art to be seen in those days. However, I was fortunate enough to receive my first indication that there was such a thing as the visual arts when I was at this school. The thing that set me going here was Daniel O'Connell, Father Daniel O'Connell, SJ. And he would pin colour postcards of great works of art that had taken his fancy on the third division notice board, which in those days used to be just outside there. And I vividly remember in 1954, there appeared on the notice board this extraordinary image of de Chirico's called The Mystery and Melancholy of a Street. And it seemed to me then to be one of the most genuinely magical acts of the human imagination that I've ever come across. I know that it was at that point my life changed and that ultimately I became an art critic. It remained almost impossible to know what was happening in art outside Australia. The occasional major show made it across the Pacific, but there was no inclination on the part of museums to purchase modern works. We will return to Australia beyond the fatal shore. No Bob. No Bob. That'd be right. Look, he said he'd meet yeah. us in front of the uh, Blue Poles this afternoon. So let's just queue up here for a bit. Yeah, okay. In 1974, something remarkable happened. The National Gallery in Canberra bought Blue Poles, a major work by the American abstract expressionist Jackson Pollock. And they spent $1.4 million of public money on it, which provoked quite a response. I think that Blue Poles is frightful, but I belong to the school that says if you've no talent, then go abstract. Well, what I was thinking of is how Australia is going to receive a painting of this sort. A painting of this type requires a sophistication. When it was first put up, of course, people couldn't see any meaning in it at all. Oh. And I say they weren't trying because I see goals and point posts. It's a metaphor for Australian sport, and of course, Jackson himself could have been Australian. Yeah, he loved to drink, root, punch people out the Australian way, drive cars, smash them into trees. Eventually, it was Scots the better of him that he actually killed himself yeah. in this manner. <laughs> but right. before that, he left us with this masterpiece, exactly. this masterpiece of energy and creativity, of the football metaphor, of the dudes coming at you, of the Australianness of the whole bloody thing. Oh, no, it's a brilliant picture. The nation wasn't sure whether it had been conned or not. Once we saw it, <laughs> We knew we'd got it cheap. Yeah. Yeah. Here we had an Australian government that was pioneering the cause of, a, of, of modern art. Mm. It dragged Australia into the modern era. We were at the vanguard yeah. of what was happening in America in the 50s, yeah. if you know what I mean. We could recognise it. We could recognise its, its greatness. We could recognise its Australianness. Yeah. And I think the rest of the world was green with, en with envy. Oh, yeah. Green at the gills with envy yeah. as to what was happening in this land down under. What was going on? Right. We might as well set off. Uh, still no Bob, by the looks. No. Bugs him. Yeah, let's go. Bugs him. In that moment, it seemed as though the whole cultural climate of Australia was opening and shifting. Buying blue poles didn't change Australian art, but it did change Australian feelings about art. There's a very good spirit of um, sort of intellectual activity and intellectual interest in Australia, but um, generally, there's this terrible lethargy that's very difficult to overcome. Mm. Where does the lethargy come from? No, no, I, I think it comes from our isolation. A sense, a sense that everything's okay in this place because we're not really Who's affected. Watching? Yeah, because we're not really affected by the rest of the world and we're not really part of the rest of the world. We're safe, we're sort of this unique exception to all of the norms. 
The results of our insularity live on here in the mountain lair of one of our worst but most celebrated artists, Norman Lindsay. He drew inspiration from Europe, but certainly not the Europe of the 20th century. He saw himself as the Rubens of Australia. Lindsay hated modernism. He thought it was a Jewish plot, that he was Picasso's worst enemy, and that Matisse went weak at the knees at the sound of the name Norman Lindsay. It was a weirdly conservative, delusional stance. The Rococo costume party was meant to last forever, as I found when I came filming here in the 1970s. When they massed together like enormous gladioli, as here in the old man's house at Springwood, the effect is quite overpowering. The stereotype of women that obsessed him came, in fact, from the psychological eyeline of a randy kid looking upon nakedness for the first time and finding it both obsessive and slightly demonic. And that's precisely the appeal of the pictures. As a randy kid myself, I remember finding a set of Lindsay prints stashed in the pantry and studying them very closely. But the etchings offer nothing much beyond that first boyish thrill. Lindsay remains a notable figure still, given the moral climate in which he was working. At the start of the century, nudity was taboo in Australia, both in art and in life. The one place where anything like an erotic display of the body could exist was the beach. And for that very reason, there existed a ban on daylight bathing until 1903. But now our lives are lived out by the ocean. The 20th century has seen an exodus from the interior to the coast. We are a civilization like lemmings advancing on the sea. It's estimated that one in three Australians now live within a 15 minute drive of the beach. The coast has replaced the bush as the chief spatial and symbolic focus of our culture. Despite the size of this continent, we are islanders, sea people. We are gathered here around these ashes all that's left to us of Brian, to pay our last deep respects to him, keeping our eyes fixed on the cross of Jesus, we say in groping faith that this is not the end, that our God is a God of the living, compassionate God, remember Brian as we remember and pray for him as your spirit hovered over the waters of old. Care for our brother in death as we take his ashes to their resting place, to your creation from which they came. Once we began colonising the beach and the bathing ban was lifted, we saw the dangers of our waters. Beach life soon became centred on surf life-saving clubs run by local volunteers. This one at Bronte is probably Australia's oldest, but you find them all up and down the coast. The rituals and traditions of clubby culture, especially life-saving, gave us our beach identity. Fashion vomits, fashion vomits. It's exam time at Bronte for these young hopefuls trying to become qualified lifesavers. Oh, well, what else have we told you not to touch if you see the beach? A syringe. A syringe, that's right. Fashion vomits, fashion vomits. What's a syringe? Everyone can tell you what a syringe is. On summer weekends, you see these rituals on every beach. Instead of just enjoying ourselves, beach life became institutionalised. Excuse me, all right? She'll be fine. 
surf life saving through the ages has been built on a lot of discipline. You have to keep control on all the beaches from the day you join, even till after you've retired from your active days, you're still bound to abide by the rules we lay down. We do not like to see any hooligans on the beach, uh, larrikinism. We do not like to see people drinking. We take pride in our beach. Club patrols have always tried to make the beach decent as well as safe. Bare-butted paradise was for Tahitians, not for us. In the 1950s, local councils even employed beach inspectors to dictate the terms of proper conduct and dress. And he's saying to her, get off the beach, you look obscene. But at the start of the 60s, something happened that the clubs and the beach inspectors couldn't control. A revolution. Small, lightweight fiberglass surfboards were introduced to Australia from Malibu. Their manoeuvrability allowed surfers to develop their own styles. For the first time, surfing was about individualism. A counterculture was born, and the board rider emerged as the first anti-hero of the beach, a larrikin of the waves. In his surf films, Paul Witzig chronicled this emerging scene. The sort of military discipline that the clubs presented was no longer attractive. You know, it was obnoxious and nobody wanted to put on these funny little hats and march up and down with reels and that sort of thing, you know. That wasn't really what surfing was all about. We were perceived as rebellious, dangerous. We were attacking the pillars of society. We were encouraging youth to run away, leave school, leave home. Paul's films show how important surfing was to our own version of the 1960s experience. Music, drugs, anti-war protest, they all came together in surf culture. The surfers Paul filmed were the icons of their generation. We were showing the films in cinemas, in halls, in surf clubs, and we were just a circus, you know. We would come to town, and all the surfers would come to town, and we were an event. The physical act of riding a wave is a more beautiful experience than anything else I know. I think a spiritual thing is really part of it. We are working with the natural forces of the planet. You let go of your conscious mind and your subconscious does everything. Never having abandoned my conscious mind to the waves and being unlikely to start now, I thought the next best thing would be to join Bill Leake and his boys, Jasper and Johannes, both passionate surfers at the beach. Well, I think you're extremely politically incorrect to raise such imagery when you're talking to me. <laughs> I mean, I can barely get on the QE2, let alone on a bloody Malibu board. I go, yeah, God, love a duck. Board riding today is even bigger than it was in the 1960s, but the idea that it's a pastime for serene and peaceful people grooving on the unity of the cosmos is rubbish. It's a wonderful outlet for aggression, the mm. surfing itself. But if, if it doesn't suffice, there's usually enough aggression left if someone else is pinching your waves to take them in and give them a good hiding. Yeah. I mean, and this, uh, this happens quite regularly. Yeah. Not on the beach. I think what happens is uh, once you get out the back and you have 
a vast expanse of water between you and the land. It's almost as if the laws of the land no longer apply, and well, now, you're, right. now you're li living by a different set of rules. Now you're a full-fledged pirate. That's right. You are Captain Blood, you and are the, and the person, Captain Hook. That's right, and the bloke that's out there who is in charge rules by um, viciousness. Intimidation. And intimidation. Yeah. 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 Women didn't take a very active role in beach life until recently. Surfy chicks were basically ornaments, and the clubs only opened their doors to women in the 1980s. But now, women are muscling in on the act, literally. We will return to Australia, beyond the fatal shore, after the... And now and away in the women's surf race. This is a race of iron women, as they're known. It's an endurance event, a beach triathlon. Lee Hadler is a champion. The beach is everything in my life. My grandfather actually built Coogee Surf Club. Um, he's been given an order of Australia for the work he's done. Both my mother and father met at the surf club at, you know, at a very early age. I wouldn't go anywhere else. But um, as a female, being brought up in that lifestyle, you're one of the boys. And you know, you're always doing things that they do. You knock about with them and you're just treated, everyone's treated the same. While women are now welcomed into the testosterone displays that account for so much of our public life, the main bonds holding that life together are between men. Look, there is a special bond between males. When you see big, fit blokes bent over in front of you, yeah. with their buttocks glaring up at you, yeah. you'd be weird if you didn't want to poke your head down in between them if you didn't want to go in yeah. and feel the comfort yeah. yes. of a couple of big buttocks strapped to your head. It's nothing like that. No, that's true. And if you don't understand that simple fact, the mm. elegance of that simple fact, mm. you don't understand, understand the Australian male psyche. Is this your pass to come in here, is it? Mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, for camera. Now, you're excited? Um, Paul yeah, Freeman right. photographs sports Pardon? stars. Taking death? New. This kind of candid yet arty portraiture has become a real phenomenon in Australia. I guess as soon as you remove the clothes from one of those players and put them into the same positions they might incur in the field, it's all of a sudden sexualising it or it's all of a sudden um, showing people blatantly that it's a very sexualised imagery. That is disturbing to them because it's like... Oh, 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 oh. They don't want to recognise that there's any kind of homoerotic content. Paul's most famous subject was Ian Roberts, the hard man of rugby league. Have you ever tried to get naked in front of a camera? <laughs> Mate, you got that. I had to make sure it was a warm day because it was never going to be on a cold day. Ian is a rugby legend. His stamina and skill turned the fortunes of the Sydney Souths, a notoriously tough side that Ian played for from his late teens. Football well probably was and still is the most homophobic area of Australian society. And the difficulty for Ian too was that you know, here was this saviour and this golden boy who was gay, was a homosexual. And he knew it, and no one else did, but gradually the rumours went round, of course, and infiltrated Souths after a few years that, you know, he was a bloody poof. So there was this dichotomy between the hero, the hero and the saviour and the fact that he was a poof. Five minutes to sit there, Ian Roberts, who realised the danger, interfered with... When Ian signed a lucrative deal with Manly, the Sydney South's main rivals, things heated up. Once he was in the enemy camp, it was like, ah, oh, you faggot, Roberts, you bastard, you... he was a traitor. I was playing for Manly uh, against St George, and a crowd supporter at half time as we were running off leaned over and, and hit me in the side of the head. You know, you, you faggot, blah, 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 blah. And I jumped the fence, I was like, oh, I mean, the police jumped in, what's the point? Ian realised he had to face the truth. Paul's photo shoot started this. It was the first time an Australian sportsman had ever come out as gay. He got really positive feedback both within the gay areas of Sydney and also from teenagers living out in the cloistered suburbs. Uh, and that gave him the confidence to actually just finally come out and to, to be that role model. 
Please, at some stage tonight, consider all the men, women and children affected with HIV AIDS who are living in poverty. Enjoy your night having Mardi Gras, people. It's a wonderful irony that Australia hosts the biggest festival of gay and lesbian culture on the planet. You know, you may think I'm quite cuckoo for thinking this, but this is a spectacle that makes me really proud to be in Australia. Why? Because it is about tolerance, much more than it's about ideology. Sydney's gay and lesbian Mardi Gras has become a worldwide symbol of joyful Australian self-expression. In real life, Australians are still pretty hostile to gays. But we're also very short of binding social rituals, and the Mardi Gras is one of the few that we have. Those who watch it aren't necessarily binding to gayness. They're there because everyone loves a parade. The counterpart to pleasure is never far away. Are we really, truly having fun yet? The wowsers are still staring at us. Just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water. Dear God, just thanks for the awesome weather. Thanks for providing the waves. I just pray that you protect each one of us out there as we're surfing and having fun. Just... These guys are part of a fast growing movement, the Christian surfers. Lord God, and just let us be lights to your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.